mythology. I always get tongue tied there. Okay, so now let's look at Paul uh, and how this gospel, this good news of a resurrection, affected him. Uh, we got to remember that Paul, uh, Paul was of the dysphoria. And wh- what do we mean when we say that he's of the dysphoria? What does the word dysphoria mean? We recall um, the, it's the period in which the Jews had scattered all over the empire of Rome. I mean, they were everywhere. Um, in the first century, there were between 5 million and 6 million Jews ocup- occupying the Roman Empire. More than what lived in Judea. There were more Jews elsewhere than what lived in the region of Judea. And the Jews made up more than 10% of most of the major cities. So you can see how important they were and how already Im- imbibed they become within the culture of, uh, of Rome. In Alexandria, there were 180 Jewish citizens and slaves of more than 50,000 in Rome. And the Jews were scattered thick throughout the empire. While most would prefer to stay near the temple, especially those who had a strong conviction regarding the rituals and the scholarly schools of learning, uh, there were many cultural centers among the cities where the Jews could attend and receive excellent instruction and development without being close to the temple. Uh, itself, and such was the case of Paul. Um, Paul uh, Paul's inst- was instructed under Gamaliel, and so you have to ask, well, where was Gamaliel's school? Gamaliel was based in Jerusalem, uh, being a member of the Sanhedrin, and is highly likely that he could easily make his way to the city where Paul was from, which was Tarsus, and so uh, and elaborate. Uh, through the elaborate travel system uh, that was in place at the time. Uh, there were, they were free to move about the empire in a network of commercial and uh, familiar roads and educational opportunities afforded such a rich and diverse uh, culture. And we know that the Pharisees were, uh, were active missionaries uh, that would go throughout the Roman Empire. Even Jesus would say in Matthew twenty three fifteen that they would travel over land and sea to do what? To make a convert. So we know that the Pharisees were very mission-minded and they would travel over land and sea just to uh, make a convert uh, to their religion. There's... There's no reason to think that Paul would not have received a full Pharisaical training in Tarsus or later in Damascus, not the center where, of Jerusalem where all of the other stuff was going on. And there's no reason to think that, Paul, in, that Paul's view of Jerusalem, um, that the temple would be central to his views and culture uh, and the gospel he was preach, that he would preach. It was more consistent under Paul's cultural circumstances to see his writings having uh, um, the resurrected centrality rather than a Jerusalem judgment focus. And so um, when Paul became a Christian, it was all about the resurrection of Christ, which wasn't Jerusalem centered. Um, and that, that's a big point because uh, Christians were uh, em- embarking on the resurrection of Christ, not on the destruction of Jerusalem, which was, which was gone, you see, or, or you know, would be gone uh, at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And so um, the, the idea here is that uh, Paul's... Uh, when Paul became a follower of Christ, his focus was not on putting down Jerusalem. His focus was completely on uh, Christ. God was going to take care of Jerusalem, uh, and he was going to continue uh, to preach, preach Christ. Almost overnight, uh, the, Jesus, uh, the Jesus followers uh, and the founding of the churches in the empire... Uh, began. I mean, it was uh, really a dramatic change and a quick 
uh, change to, uh, to Jesus Christ in those areas. And that's why it stirred up the Jews all over the place because it was making a dramatic impact on their areas. It had reached Paul's area almost as quickly as it had Jerusalem. Otherwise, Paul could not have persecuted them in different places and then end up being joined to them in another. You see, he was persecuting them one place, and then when he's on his way to another place, he's converted uh, to them, and then he finds himself going into all these other cities um, fairly quickly. I mean, it's a, it's a busy, uh, busy uh, time and, and ways to get around. And it's clear that Paul had no authoritative power to persecute the Christians as a Roman citizen, a Roman citizen. Paul says that he was far ahead of his Jews in his zeal. Um, and so, uh, basically, Paul was one who took it upon himself to be the leader of the persecution of the Jews. And that's the reason why he was a focal point uh, for them. I'm sure there were others that would go around and do that, but he says that his zeal as a Jew was far surpassing of all the others. Uh, and that would account uh, for the reason why he was so against uh, the Christians. Um, what he would he would use what means he had to remove them, uh, which meant any authority he had had to be connected with throwing them out of the assemblies where the Jews met for instruction, uh, learning, and worship. And this also gives us insight as to how the Jewish Christians were spreading the message of the resurrection and how further Christian instruction was being spread so rapidly. How was it being spread? It was being spread through the Jewish uh, meetings. Uh, and so Paul had to have, or Saul at the time, had to have the authority to go into these places and uproot them and, and toss them out. Uh, Paul was an adherer to the law of Moses, a Pharisee, and though he was not based in Jerusalem, he was well connected in different areas through the network uh, provided by the empire. Uh, so that uh, the centrality of his power and authority did not derive and did not and was not derived um, on a Jerusalem central view that would permeate his gospel, but what uh, but what does permeate it is that he claimed that he had an encounter with Christ, the risen Lord. And so, um, so the, the point there uh, being is that uh, Paul uh, did not just wait for somebody to ask him to go persecute the Christians. He was fully engaged leader of this movement, and then these uh, Sanhedrin and the uh, uh, Jewish leaders would actually give Paul the letters to go and persecute somewhere else, and, uh, or invite him to go and persecute somewhere else. Paul was a master with his weapons that he used in his warfare against the Christians. He was fierce in argument. Uh, knowledgeable regarding fine distinctions of the Scripture and the interpretations of the Scripture. He had a wicked, sardonic humor and biting criticism. Uh, seeing what he does within the company of Christians, we can know with some degree that, uh, of certainty that he honed his skill uh, while he was against the Christians in the synagogue, refuting them, ridiculing them, and driving them out when they attempted to get a foothold. At some point, the Jews had won the right in some cities to uh, disciple their people, um, it, uh, or discipline their people, uh, because uh, Paul, when he became a Christian, it says that he received uh, stripes, uh, received punishment by the Jews themselves. So at some point during all this persecution, the Jews had uh, gained the right to beat the Christians, to punish the Christians by physical force. Uh, and, um, and Paul, no doubt, was part of that as well. Uh, it was com uh, a community uh, intervention by the Jews uh, regarding family uh, disputes within within their religion, as the Romans would uh, pick up on and and think of it as being. 
Uh, Paul's persecution had to rise to a level in which he gained uh, communal support uh, in his uh, persecution activities. Thus we find him holding the coats of those who would stone Stephen as one leading and condoning the action, yet not throwing a stone himself, but being a member of that community, he was involved in, um, in that work. Um, and so you can see how Paul would go into a place, he would embark himself or, or be part of that community, uh, he would lead an insurrection against the Christians, clearing out the, uh, the place, and, and, and he, the interesting thing is, is concerning his wit. Uh, I, I almost would say Paul had a dry sense of humor. Um, he... Uh, his wit was received by his audience as it was intended. And, and here's a few examples of what we might could see in scriptures as that. Uh, take the case where he threatens to take a club to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21. All right, uh, look, look at that uh, real quickly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 21. And, and it kind of helps us to see how Paul wrote... Uh, using a bit of humor, uh, maybe what we'd call a bit of dark humor. Um, but uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and uh, verse 21, uh, he says, uh, you know, for, uh, verse 20, For the kingdom of God is not uh, just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Now, which do you choose? Should I come with a rod to punish you? Or should I come with love and a gentle spirit? Now, you may read that and pass over it, but if you, got, if you remember what Paul's background is and what he did to the churches when he went into those places, uh, he would beat them. He would be part of the group that would stone them. He was part of the group that would ridicule them and drive them out of the synagogues. So when this guy would come in and he would use these phrases within his letters like, should I come after you with a rod or a club? Or would you rather me come after you with love? You see, and so no doubt that the readers of that knew Paul's background and would kind of take his humor to, that reinforced what he was trying to get across. And um, so uh, that's just an example. Like here, Another one is um, uh, his, his uh, audience... Uh, understood to be a, a, almost a comic relief in his writing. Uh, he provoked by the people in Corinth who had called him weak. You know, the church at Corinth was calling him. Oh, he's he's a weak individual, and and uh, uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and he would respond with, "Should I bring a club and and." Uh, or should I or should I come to you in peace? It's almost like a father saying, You're not too big for me to whip yet. You know, that that type of comic I would take it to be. Um, his real weapon was always language, to which his audience responded with acknowledgement and uh, would transform uh, and would be transformative just by his words. They understood his poignant humor by an acknowledgement found in Paul's second letter uh, response where he had wounded them uh, with just the letter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 8, he, um, he refers to and he says, um, you know, I wounded you with my writings, but I'm glad I did because it produced repentance. And so coming from an individual who had a physical um, uh, presence among them and the persecution among the church, uh, that was poignant to them. They would understand what he's saying uh, to them, and um, and it would become more of a tenderness uh, within his writing and how he could move them with his words. Because, I mean, if you had someone like that who had been transformed from a person who would come and persecute you and may have dragged drug your one of your family members out of the house or out of the synagogue and placed in uh, in prison and you know standing there being part of a, a group that had been stoned when now you see such a transformation in his life you would you would see more of a a tender response when he would pull 
uh, words into the conversation um, from his past life. And um, I think that he did that on quite a number of occasions. Um, and so, uh, Paul's major persecution focused on what he believed to be that was false at the time he was a, a Pharisee among Pharisees. And he had to study the claims well before he came to accept them to be true. But what was the object of his focus? Um, it was not the Christians speaking against the Jewish rituals, uh, like the necessity of circumcision, though at some point that would be a, a point of conflict once they followed the truth uh, to, to its natural inference. There was those types of things that they were... Um, that they would have to make a stance on regarding the Jewish rituals. But that wasn't the, the point that really lit uh, Saul uh, on fire. Um, it, it would be the very claim that there was a resurrected Lord. Um, at this point, it was uh, central to the proclamation of the message that was being delivered uh, by those who had witnessed Jesus being resurrected from the dead, uh, and uh, seeing him ascend to the heavens. Uh, the, fir the first believers were circumcised people who had been observing the law. And yet here comes Christ uh, in, in the witnesses of his resurrection and his, um, and his uh, ascension to heaven. Uh, that would be the initial uh, persecution point that Paul uh, would, would raise and go after them on. Uh, the initial difference uh, from other Jews was a central demand in their proclamation of the resurrected and crucified man. This very thing Paul would later call scandalous to the Jews. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, he says that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ was what was considered by the Jews to be of utmost scandalous. Scandalion. You know, it's the... It's the uh, really a bad thing uh, for them to, um, uh, that they confronted. And what would become central, center to his own faith, the risen Jesus, was the thing he felt that was first necessary to oppose and remove. But when we see uh, uh, Paul um, see Jesus on the road to Damascus, we see his entire life transformed by the risen Savior, so much so that the point that was his major point of contention became his major and, I guess you could say, obsessive point uh, within his letter. And so this, uh, this places great emphasis and weight on why it was necessary for Christ to present himself to Paul on the fateful road to Damascus. Uh, the appearance uh, to him would have been the supreme refutation, refutation of all of his objections to Christianity. And consider for a moment Paul's words on the subject of the witnesses. He said uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, he said uh, following his appearance to Peter and the twelve, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at uh, one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Now, how would Paul know some have died? How would Paul know that some had died? Because he was there at their death. Stephen and other Christians that uh, he was, had a hand in persecuting... And so he knew who they were. He knew the ones who would still be alive. How would he know that? Because he has interrogated them. And his interrogations produced uh, their, their conviction that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Uh, so it, pro uh, it produced those who were still alive uh, that he knew and those who have died as well. Uh, within that. So how did Paul know? Well, because he was involved uh, with knowing uh, that firsthand. 
Uh, Paul had heard directly from these witnesses during the time he persecuted them, as well as the time following his conversion. This would be the case because he knew some had died and some were still living at the time he wrote the letter. If Paul knew a great deal about the life of Jesus, he does not share it with us in his writings. Uh, There's little, if any, reference to the life of Jesus prior to his crucifixion in Paul's writings. Uh, uh, Other than the acknowledgement that he did live and generalities about being a good and godly man. And it's true that the letters are not uh, expositions of the meaning of Jesus' life. The letters addressing specific problems, uh, and he uses material from Christ's life only when necessary, uh, and he quotes the, and paraphrases on occasion what others have said to him. And so Paul's words are not completely the same as, um, as you read in other writings, uh, but they are very similar, which tells us that they are from Paul's um, own uh, understanding of, uh, of what had occurred. But when it came to things in which he had personal knowledge and witnessed for himself, he speaks with clarity and with detail, almost in overkill fashion. He goes on at length to uh, leave no doubt of what he presents directly from himself with no clouded or concealed language. Uh, and this is, this is important, and, and you almost would say that uh, Paul might have been a little OCD on these facts in which he personally was in, engaged in and gave in great detail and uh, defense uh, for his position. Uh, there's no hidden meaning or mystical hidden meaning within his words. In fact, Paul is clear uh, to say that he purposefully uh, writing without hidden or secretive language where he says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse uh, 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He doesn't want anybody to be left unclear about what he's saying. Uh, It's no wonder that uh, that Paul is an expert on the appearance of the risen Lord and that his letters present his encounter in an almost obsessive and compulsive way. The most important event of Paul's life, that which determined everything else, was his encounter with Jesus. And uh, we'll see that come out. Um, He says, uh, My urgent concern was to pass on to you what was passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the sacred writings, that he was buried, that he arose on the third day in accordance with the sacred writings, that he appeared to Cephas, or Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared at the same time to more than 500 of the brothers, most of whom were still with us, though some have died. And after that, he appeared to James, then to all uh, the emissaries. And finally, by the delayed birth, uh, he appeared to me, Though I am the least of the apostles or emissaries, one, uh, one not even worthy to be called an apostle since I persecuted God's gathering. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 9. That's, 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 that's Paul's clear um, direction on the matter. The principal thing to notice here is that Jesus appeared to Paul. He was seen, Paul says here, uh, the... Uh, Paul led, putting in his own record along with all of the other apostles. He calls himself apostle, and he says all apostles have seen the risen Savior, therefore he's including himself in that. And not only does he do that, he goes on to clarify it even further in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. He says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So there is no doubt about his clarity and how he wrote these things and, um, and his position on them. Uh, that is why he can report that he ha- had, call- had his calling as an apostle to the nations directly from Jesus. 
Uh, I, Paul, made an, an apostle, not in hu- a human way or by any man, but through Jesus, Messiah, and his Father, God, who raised him from the dead, Galatians 1 and verse 1. Uh, all, of all the large company of witnesses to the resurrection, Paul, uh, only Paul has described as much as possible what the resurrection is like. Um, and uh, the others' remark, uh, remarks are, uh, the other writers' remarks are uh, less clear uh, and almost elusive or un- had an uncanny experience uh, with their encounters. Um, for instance, uh, when they first saw Jesus in the Gospels, they didn't recognize him. Uh, he seemed to be uh, paradoxically eating food with them on the seashore, yet ghostly when he would glide through doors and things like that. He would appear as an ordinary gardener, an ordinary traveler, um, yet transfigured. Paul, who knows what he's talking about, says the risen body does not fit any of our expectations. So his description of the resurrection of Christ is a little is, is in greater detail and greater clarity than what was previously uh, given by any of the writers. Paul, um, so uh, somebody will ask, uh, Paul writes, in what way are the dead raised? And in what kind of body do they fare? Don't be a fool, he says. Even a seed, you know, sows does not come to life until it dies. And what you sow is not the plant it will become. It is a mere seed of wheat, perhaps, or some other grain. God gives it uh, the plant, uh, God gives it the plant as he decreed, a different plant according to what the seed is sown. And all flesh is not the same. But that of humans, or that of beasts, or that of birds, or that of fish. There, moreover, are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. And the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one thing, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. There is one splendor for the sun, and another for the moon, and another for the stars, since uh, since stars uh, since star from star differs in splendor. That is how it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sowed, sown in disintegration, raised in integrity. Sowed in disgrace, it is raised in splendor. Sown in frailty uh, and raised in strength. What is sown in uh, a sensate body is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a sensate body or one that has you know, the physical attributes. There is also a spiritual body, for it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, but the last man, Adam, uh, became a life-giving spirit. Yet the spirit comes not first, rather the, uh, the flesh or the sensate is first, and then the spiritual. The first man came from the clay of the earth, the second man from heaven, as the first man was of the clay, so are the others clay-like. And as the last man was from heaven, so are all of his fellows heavenly. And we have borne the likeness of the man of clay, we shall also bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So brothers, I assure you, flesh and blood cannot have any inheritance in God's reign, any more than the dis- uh, disintegration can have any inheritance in the integrity. That is the secret thing I am telling you. Though we all may not die, we shall all be altered at a stroke at a blink of an eye, uh, at the last trumpet blast, and the dead will awaken in integrity, and we shall be altered. Then must disintegration be clothed with integrity, and death must be clothed with deathlessness. When such death is clothed in deathlessness, the word will apply, death, what is what victory have you? Uh, what stab death is left in you? Paul is in, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 
35 through 55. Paul inevitably associated what, was, what other risen bodies would be like from his encounter with that of Jesus. He will, be trans, he will transfigure our bodies, lowliness, into the pattern of his dazzling body. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. By looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord mirrored back on us, we are transformed into that image from splendor to splendor by the working of the Lord's Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. When Paul talks of seeing the splendor of Jesus' face, it's, also, uh, it's often assumed or asserted that he is registering the internal ascent of faith. But there's no reason that we should um, ar- make his uh, statement an artificial one or a figurative one apart from his report that he had actually seen the Lord's face. God who said, let light shine out of dark, has shown a light in our heart to understand the splendor of God that is the feature of the Messiah. First, uh, first uh, Corinthians 4 and verse 6. So Paul, as our expert on a risen body, he, show, he shows a fascination with it over and over again. He writes about the longing for it, Uh, When this transitory house that we inhabit is dissolved, we uh, know uh, another housing is prepared for us by God, a lasting casement in the heavens not made by hand. We naturally chafe in our present casing, yearning for the heavenly one to be put on over it, lest we be caught naked, uh, but for our first uh, habitation. We chafe while... uh, we're pent in this narrow enclosure, though we were wanting to put it off until it is enclosed with a new casing, so that the moral uh, mortal shall be absorbed into the immortal, uh, immortal. God has prompted us to this yearning and has given us the spirit of a surety of its fulfillment. Embracing ourselves on all sides then, realizing that while we are held in our bodies, we are held off from the Lord. We fare on then realizing that while we, um, uh, we fare on believing beyond what we see. Embracing ourselves, as I say, and taking heart to leave the body's home and enter the Lord's home, making it our point of pride to win his favor, however disembodied or reembodied we are. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9. Now this is a, a literal translation from the Greek, so it reads a little different than the King James. But, uh, but what he's pointing out there is that this earthly body, or some, some would say the ta- this earthly tabernacle is going to be dissolved and, um, at some point. But he says the spirit which God gives us uh, is the down payment or the pledge that what he has promised will occur. And what does Paul know about the resurrection? is that it is going to be a bodily resurrection, a body that's changed for heavenly dwelling that will last for eternity with no um, dissolvement of it or no decay of it. Uh, and he, he is saying this based upon his, un, his seeing the Messiah, uh, the resurrected Lord uh, who was in front of him. So when he do- talks about these things, um, he, he is well aware of it. And so when he, when he talks closer to the end of his life, we can see there is a yearning to put off. Uh, he, he, remember what he says um, in one of his letters, I, I'm at a strait betwixt the two, you know, wanting to go on, but knowing that to stay here is better for you. Well, somebody who has a, a, a vision of what the resurrection truly is, no wonder he is so motivated and moved to continue. And in fact, I would offer to us that that is the transformation that took place in his heart. It's what made him um, 
uh, the, the vision of the resurrected Messiah not only convinced him that Jesus was the resurrected Messiah and the one promised, but it also instilled in him a conviction that Jesus said, we are going to be like him uh, in the end. And so I think that that would be a prime motivating factor that Paul would hold on to and the reason why he could endure such persecution of the world uh, against him. Um, let me let me uh, close uh, close with this. Uh, 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 let me go on down and and uh, and pick up. Uh, this is like six pages of notes to get to with with all of uh, all of Paul's writings. Um, just to say that he he was so close to this good news of the resurrection that he took it personal. It was personal to him. Him being part of the body of Christ became who he was. And so when he could say, you know, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself for me. He is now not speaking of just something that is separated from him. Something that he saw. He he was convinced by witnessing. It is now something that has transformed him from the inside. um, To be part of that body. And so let me close with um, him developing uh, this type of of idea. uh, uh, when he, when he would say, um, of course, Galatians 2.20, uh, it, I no longer live, it's, it's Christ who lives in me. It is the Messiah that I take pride for service to God, though I dare not say this uh, is anything but Jesus himself working through me to bring the nations to his service, Romans 15.17-18. Uh, I made up my mind not to display any learning to you, only Jesus and Him as being crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. And in Galatians 6 uh, verse 17, I bear on my body Jesus' wounds. That's how close He was uh, to the resurrected Lord. Um, Paul's identification with Jesus uh, was a personal matter, and it was what he saw as the essence of believing uh, in Christ. It's what made them holy. Uh, it, the, the persons in Jesus Christ uh, was, were so associated with him uh, that they could say we bear the, the wounds of Jesus in our bodies. Um, and, and how did he get that? Baptism had incorporated in them the messianic fulfillment of all that was about the resurrection. We are buried with him by baptism into his death. So that just as the Messiah rose from the dead to, splendor, to the splendor of his father, we should fare forward in a life Entirely new, Romans 6, 3 through 4. Anyone in the Messiah is a new order of being. The ancient things have passed away and see the new ones begin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. In Paul's dizzying early years, or early days of communication with Jesus, he had to reconcile his earlier devotion to the Jewish law with his experience of the risen Jesus. And he came to recognize uh, the, the fulfillment of, uh, of all that was said in the old was found in Jesus Christ. And so that was the transfer, uh, transformative power of the resurrection that is, as it had on, uh, had on Paul and his life. And so I just encourage us that, you know, in the days that we live in today and the difficulties that we have and we go through, 
Um, Paul, would, Paul would also remind us that uh, Christ knows these things. Uh, he suffered for us. Uh, and as we suffer as a Christian, uh, God is, Christ is not turning His back on us. He is there with us and He is supporting us through every event. And how do we know this? Because He went to the cross he suffered the death on our behalf, uh, and then He was resurrected. Well, if we are suffering on the behalf of Christ, um, and we have died to the world, uh, then we know just as assuredly as Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we will also share in that resurrection of life, in the, in the splendor of, um, of that new world uh, of, uh, of heaven, uh, for eternity, uh, and so we should never give up. And so I love reading Paul's words when he talks about the resurrection because I, I, I can't get enough of that, and that's words of encouragement um, for us all. And, and that's the good news I think that the world needs to hear more of, uh, more of today. So uh, we'll close with that. Um, that's a good stop in place. Uh, but just go through your, read Paul's letters and see how many times he talks about the resurrection and, um, and how clear he makes it within his writings. It's um, very encouraging and, and uplifting. So we'll stop there. Thanks.